We're going to start this video by talking about glycoside formation, which is an extremely, extremely important reaction type for carbohydrates. And to begin talking about this, I actually want to turn the clock back, if you will, and talk about hemiacetal and acetal formation involving uh, ketones and aldehydes with alcohols in general. And to start this discussion, I want to open the sugar that's on the slide back to its open chain form. So here, all I've done is just opened the sugar and put the rest of the sugar kind of behind this squiggly and just focused on carbon one, which is an aldehyde when this sugar opens. And that's worth pausing and verifying to make sure you can see how this particular sugar, which is an aldose, opens to form an aldehyde in the open chain form. That aldehyde could hypothetically form an acetal, right? With something like methanol or ethanol when the sugar was placed in solution. And the basic mechanism here under acidic conditions would involve protonation of the carbonyl oxygen, followed by nucleophilic attack by the alcohol, nucleophilic addition, right? AD sub N, a proton transfer to neutralize the product. And we have a neutral hemiacetal here. And then we could protonate the OH, lose water and add a second equivalent of alcohol to get to the acetal. This is the basic idea behind glycoside formation as well, except all of the action happens not via an open chain carbonyl group, but the closed form acetal and a positively charged intermediate derived from that that we're about to see when we talk about the mechanism of, of glycoside formation. So a glycoside really you can think of as an acetal of a monosaccharide. So if we take a look at the general structure of a glycoside shown here, notice that we've converted a hemiacetal in the starting uh, glucose here into an acetal. The OH group has been replaced with OR. And this kind of acetal formation from a cyclic sugar hemiacetal is known as glycoside formation. And this is known as a glycoside. From the perspective of this R group, that R group has picked up a sugar. And that's what glycosidation sort of evokes, this idea that we have installed a sugar molecule on the R group. For example, this can be biochemically important. Glycoproteins are made by putting sugar molecules onto protein chains after translation in what's called a post-translational modification. That's one application of glycosidation, and there are about a gazillion others. All right, so how does this work mechanistically? This is our big question from an organic chemistry two point of view. And one thing to note is that the only hydroxyl group that reacts is this one. Only the hydroxyl group at carbon one reacts. None of the other hydroxyls react. Why is this? Well, the mechanism makes it very clear. Under the acidic conditions, all of the hydroxyl groups could be protonated. Let's start by getting that out of the way. We could protonate at any of these hydroxyl groups, and that happens to some extent sort of randomly, right? Because these are all similar in acidity. But only one protonation leads to further action, and that's protonation of the hydroxyl group at carbon one. Only that protonation leads to a productive subsequent step. And the step that occurs is the elimination of water from this cation to produce a resonance stabilized cation, a beta elimination in our mechanistic language. This cation right here is resonance stabilized. The resonance structure we've drawn has positive charge on the oxygen, but there is a second resonance form with positive charge on carbon that you should definitely pause and draw to make sure you understand why this is a relatively stable cation. If we tried to do this dance of put a proton on and then lose water from any of the other hydroxyls, we'd end up with a much, much less stable cation. For example, if we tried to do that here, we'd end up with a, a primary carbocation and that's gonna be a no-no. So far and away, the most stable place to lose water from is the anomeric carbon. And now we've created something right here that looks a lot like this protonated carbonyl intermediate. Notice the analogy between this and this. They are very, very similar. The only difference is this has a proton hanging out on the oxygen. This has a carbon group. And so this carbon right here is highly electrophilic and amenable to nucleophilic attack by an alcohol and a variety of other nucleophiles actually. So here we're focusing on oxygen, but nitrogen nucleophiles, sulfur nucleophiles, and even halogens can be made to attack at that carbon. 
which is again electrophilic. So what we get here now, because that's the most electrophilic carbon by far, this is why only that anomeric hydroxyl group reacts. And the alcohol adds in in a nucleophilic addition step, highly analogous to acetal formation at this point. This produces the protonated glycoside. Notice the only difference between this and the final product is an extra proton on the OR group. And so we lose that proton in the final step to get to the neutral glycoside, which is again, essentially an acetal of the sugar where an alcohol nucleophile has essentially displaced water in the product. I actually wanna look at this one more time, cutting out the acetal analogy that we made just to make it a little more clear which, which steps are specifically involved in glycoside formation. So we start by protonating at the anomeric hydroxyl group right here. Not that other deprotonations, not that other proton transfers don't happen, but this is the one that's mechanistically productive. Then we beta eliminate water to create the stabilized cation here. Then the alcohol adds in in a nucleophilic addition step to that cation. And finally, we lose a proton from the cation to give the neutral glycoside product. So this is uh, one way to think about this, right, is it's basically an SN1 type process. We create a good leaving group first. That's the purpose of the first proton transfer. But then that leaving group departs. And we've got a cation, just like an SN1, where the leaving group departs, you got a carbocation. This one just happens to be oxygen stabilized. Then a nucleophile comes in, and then we lose a proton to get to the neutral product. But that nucleophile com coming in is the same idea as SN1, right, where a nucleophile attacks the carbocation. So what we've got here, although we're using the labels beta elimination and nucleophilic addition because of the involvement of the oxygen inside the ring, basically what we've got here is an acid-catalyzed SN1 process. I do want to touch on the mechanism of mutarotation in a little more detail. We pretty quickly noted earlier that mutarotation involves conversion of an anomer into the open chain form and then the other closed form, the opposite anomer. So there's equilibration of the two anomers via the open chain form. This is shown on this slide as path A with the open chain structure drawn here. We're going to look at an alternative possibility for the mechanism of mutarotation that's generally less common than going through the open chain form, but is still, I think, useful to keep in mind, particularly as it's analogous to glycoside formation. It just involves water acting as a nucleophile here rather than some new kind of alcohol. But the typical mechanism of mutarotation, and the one that you'll see, for example, if you go out there and Google undergraduate organic chemistry, bioorganic and biochemistry notes and, and books, involves the open chain form. The open chain form is created via proton transfer of the oxygen inside the ring, followed by a beta elimination. This cleaves the CO bond in the ring and creates the CO double bond here of the carbonyl group at the anomeric carbon. And then we lose a proton to get to the neutral open chain form. So notice this is an aldose, got an aldehyde, and then the CHOH groups, and then on the other end, we've got that CH2OH here. So we've got an aldose, this is actually glucose, I believe. Now to get to the other anomer, we're gonna rotate around this bond right here, swing the aldehyde kind of down, swing the aldehyde's carbonyl oxygen down, and then recyclize by the exact reverse mechanism. Proton transfer, nucleophilic addition of the hydroxyl group now, reestablishing this CO bond, and finally loss of a proton to produce the neutral product. So this is the typical mechanism of mutarotation that you'll mostly see out there. In some cases, however, and with certain types of nucleophiles that are not necessarily water, we can get a mechanism via a positively charged oxygen stabilized carbocation intermediate. And the idea here is we protonate not the oxygen in the ring, but the oxygen out here. And after beta elimination of water, via loss of water from the anomeric carbon, right? The anomeric hydroxyl group gets protonated and then departs. We get this oxygen stabilized carbocation, which is the exact same cation that we generated in the glycoside formation mechanism back here. It actually has a special name. You'll hear it referred to as an oxocarbenium ion. It's a carbocation or, or carbenium ion stabilized by oxygen, so oxocarbenium, and that's what's going on here. And on this slide, we actually see both resonance forms of the oxocarbenium showing the delocalization of charge at carbon and oxygen. 
And now water can come in. We generated water, right, to make this cation. And so water can approach either side, right, the top or bottom face of this cation to give rise to either the original beta anomer, attack from, for example, the top would take us back where we came from, attack from the bottom would take us to the alpha anomer, and finally after loss of a proton from that water that just added, right, we'd end up at the neutral alpha anomer. So this mechanism is, I'd say, less common, but still useful in that it's highly analogous to glycoside formation, so it'll give you more insight into how glycoside formation works, and for certain types of glycosides, this kind of isomerization at the anomeric carbon can be important. When this is not OH, but this is some other group that can fall off, like a halide or an SH group or something like that, this kind of mechanism can be important.